In this experiment, we're going to test the accuracy and precision of a device designed to accurately and precisely deliver 5 milliliters of liquid into a container. This is called a volumetric pipette, and they're used regularly by chemists to deliver specific volumes. This particular volumetric pipette is designed to des deliver 5 milliliters. In this experiment, you will determine the volume of water transferred using the volumetric pipette by mass. Over several trials, you will transfer 5 milliliters of water from the beaker into an Erlenmeyer flask and record the mass. Knowing the mass of the empty flask and the mass of the flask after each sub subsequent trial of water has been added, you will subtract and find the mass of the water for each trial. Then, using the temperature of water and the density, you will determine the volume of water transferred for each trial. In this way, by doing the experiment repeatedly, you will test the precision of the experiment. Since this is a 5 milliliter volumetric pipette, you will test the accuracy because you know it should deliver 5 milliliters of water. You will then use that as your standard to determine your percent error. In order to use a 5 milliliter volumetric pipette, you're going to need to use a pipette pump. A pipette pump is designed to draw liquid into a pipette. This is done by simply scrolling the wheel and sucking the water up into the pipette. In an ideal world, you can use the pipette pump to exactly fill the, the volumetric pipette with 5 milliliters of liquid. However, it's very rare that these actually work exactly as planned. So it's much better to actually draw in more liquid than you need and then drop the volume of the liquid until you have exactly 5 milliliters. And I will demonstrate that for you now. As mentioned, a 5 milliliter volumetric pipette has just one job, to transfer 5 milliliters of liquid into another container. You'll see here that it has what's called a calibration line. The calibration line is the only marking on a 5 milliliter pipette. This is the level at which you want the liquid to be in order to deliver 5 milliliters. Now that I have all the tools that I need to use the volumetric pipette, I simply want to place the pipette into the beaker and place the pipette pump on top. Now, before I start to draw liquid into the pipette, it's very important that I lift the pipette slightly off the bottom of the beaker for the very simple reason that if it's exactly on the bottom of the beaker, you're blocking the hole where the water comes in. Once I have the pipette lifted slightly off the bottom of the beaker, I want to simply scroll the pipette wheel and draw water into the pipette. Notice that I've drawn water above the calibration line. In order to continue, what I want to do is very quickly remove the pipette pump and place my thumb on the top of the pipette to keep the liquid from flowing out. Once you've reached the calibration line, you want to transfer the pipette from the beaker into the Erlenmeyer flask and then remove your thumb. Once you remove your thumb, the liquid will flow out of the pipette and into the flask. You'll notice that it flows out quite slowly. This is because it has a very small hole in the end. This is designed on purpose so that you can actually stop at the calibration line. You'll also notice another factor that happens when you ha because there's a, such a small hole at the end of the pipette is a small amount of liquid is remaining in the pipette. The pipette is calibrated so that this small amount of liquid is taken into account. It's very important that when you're using a volumetric pipette, you do not use the pipette pump to blow the liquid out because in that case, you will not have the small amount of liquid remaining in the tip. In order to prepare the solutions that you're going to use for the titration, you're going to need five molar sodium hydroxide solution and a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. The first thing you're going to want to do is transfer two milliliters of the sodium hydroxide solution into the graduated cylinder. To do this, I'm going to use a pipette. Once I've added approximately two milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution into the graduated cylinder, I want to hold the graduated cylinder with my hands and move my eye down to the level of the graduated cylinder and remove sodium hydroxide so that I have exactly two milliliters. Next, I want to quantitatively transfer the two milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution into the volumetric flask. A volumetric flask is very similar to a volumetric pipette in that it has only one job. 
This volumetric flask's job is to hold 100 milliliters of solution. And just like a volumetric pipette, it has only one line. This line is the 100 milliliter line for this particular volumetric flask. To quantitatively transfer my sodium hydroxide solution, I first want to pour the sodium hydroxide solution into the volumetric flask. Next, I want to use a few small portions of water to rinse the flask completely of all of the sodium hydroxide solution so that I can be sure that all of the sodium hydroxide is in the volumetric flask. Once you've transferred the sodium hydroxide solution and the several rinsings of water into the volumetric flask, you next want to fill the flask with water. If you're going to do this with a pipette, you'll notice very quickly that this will take you forever. You don't want to do it with a pipette. What you want to do is you want to fill the solution, fill the flask, up into the neck by pouring. Then once you're in the neck of the flask, but still below the calibration line, you want to use the pipette to get the exact amount of solution that you need. This is the most efficient way to do this. So in order to do this, I'm going to pour the water up into the neck of the flask. Now once I'm relatively close to the calibration line, I want to use a plastic pipette, which you could find in the lab, and simply move my head to eye level and fill the flask such that the bottom of the meniscus is exactly at the calibration line. Finally, we need to mix the solution. Five molar sodium hydroxide is far more dense than water. So if I were to use this solution now, it would not be uniform throughout. To do that, you simply place the stopper on the flask, place your fingers over the stopper to make sure that it doesn't fall over, invert the flask and shake. You repeat this process several times, making sure to hold the stopper until you have a solution. Now that we've made our sodium hydroxide solution, we need to prepare our Erlenmeyer flask for the titration. In a titration, the acid always goes in the Erlenmeyer flask. We already prepared a 0.2 molar hydrochloric acid solution, as is stated in the lab manual, by adding three and a half milliliters of hydrochloric acid to about 50 milliliters of water. We then soiled the solution to make sure that it's uniform. We want to use a five milliliter volumetric pipette to transfer five milliliters of the hydrochloric acid solution into the Erlenmeyer flask. You've already used a transfer pipette previously, so we will do the same procedure now and draw the hydrochloric acid up above the calibration line, bring the solution to eye level, and stop at the calibration line. We then transfer the solution into the Erlenmeyer flask that with which we're gonna to use to perform the titration. Notice that again, I'm allowing the solution to come out by gravity and I'm not blowing it out using the pipette pump. Finally, what I want to do is use a squirt bottle of water and squirt down the sides of the Erlenmeyer flask so that all the solution is in the bottom. I then swirl the flask and now this is ready for a titration, except for I need to add indicator. Notice that it doesn't matter how much water I add to the flask, I just want to uh, rinse the solution down a little bit because the water doesn't have any acid in it. And in a titration, I'm going to react the sodium hydroxide and the hydrochloric acid. Since the water doesn't have any hydrochloric acid in it, I can use a reasonable amount. This is not to say you should fill the entire flask, but a reasonable amount of water is fine for your rinsing. Finally, I want to add a couple drops of phenolphthalein indicator. With many things in life, more is better, but phenolphthalein is not one of those things. One or two drops is plenty. Now that we have our acid in our Erlenmeyer flask and we've added indicator, you're gonna do this over four trials, but here I'm just gonna demonstrate with one trial. We need to use a burette in order to do a titration. A burette allows us to measure how much of, in this case, sodium hydroxide is used in the reaction. However, before we can use the burette, we do need to clean it, and that's very important. You're gonna need a few things to do this. You're gonna need a beaker for waste, you're gonna need a beaker for your 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide that you prepared previously, and you're gonna need a beaker of water. You're also obviously gonna need a burette, and to use the burette properly, you should also have a funnel.
Notice that a burette has a stopcock at the bottom. For when a burette stopcock is uh, perpendicular to the burette, it is closed. When it's parallel, it is open. For right now, I want to make sure that the stopcock is closed. Before and after you use a burette, it's always important to rinse it with water. We rinse it before to make sure it's clean before adding our sodium hydroxide solution. We rinse it after to make sure that there's no remaining sodium hydroxide solution. Remember that sodium hydroxide solution contains sodium hydroxide, and if the water evaporates, that'll leave solid sodium hydroxide in the burette. The burette has a very tiny hole at the end and it can become easily clogged, so it's always important to rinse a burette before and after we use it. To rinse a burette with water here, what we're first going to do is lower the burette down. For many people, you would be reaching up over your head in order to pour the solution into the burette. In this case, we're just going to rinse it with water. To lower the burette down, we simply put the burette at the edge of the table and then lower the burette so that it's an appropriate level to work with. We also want to use a funnel in order to fill the burette. It's very important that when we're adding a little bit of water to the burette to rinse it, that we hold the funnel up so that it's slightly above the uh, top of the burette. If you leave the funnel down like this, you can get an airlock, and believe it or not, you can actually fill up this funnel and none of the solution will actually go into the burette. In order to avoid that, we simply hold the funnel up a little bit. We want to rinse the burette with about three portions of five milliliters of water. This doesn't need to be exact. So I'm just gonna take my beaker of water and I'm gonna add in about five milliliters. Then what I want to do is simply open the stopcock at the bottom and allow the water to flow out. So you can see this on camera, I'm going to go ahead and pull the burette back up. Although when you're doing it, this probably isn't necessary. I'm then gonna take the waste beaker and flow the water out of the burette and into the waste beaker. Once the burette is empty, I'm gonna close and repeat this process two more times. Now that I've rinsed the burette three times with water, I want to rinse it with some of my sodium hydroxide solution. Right now, the burette is wet, and that water will dilute the sodium hydroxide solution. In order to avoid that, I want to rinse the burette with three portions of sodium hydroxide. In this case, one to two milliliters is plenty. It is a bad idea, bad practice, to pour from a volumetric flask directly into your burette. It is a much better idea to get a clean and labeled beaker. It is essential that this beaker is dry so that we don't dilute the sodium hydroxide solution. We simply add some of our sodium hydroxide into our clean, labeled, and dry beaker and use that to rinse the burette with three, two to three milliliter portions. Once the burette has been rinsed with three portions of water and three small portions of sodium hydroxide solution, we're going to want to fill the burette up in order to do the titration. A burette is used to measure the volume by difference of sodium hydroxide solution used in this titration. In order to do that, I'm going to first lower this down so that it's a, the appropriate height for me to pour into it. Then holding up the funnel, I'm going to add sodium hydroxide solution to the burette such that I have above the 10 milliliter graduation on the burette. This will ensure that I have enough sodium hydroxide solution to do the titration. One common thing that happens when using a burette is that when you fill it up, there's an air bubble still in the tip of the burette. It is essential that you remove this air bubble before you read the initial volume of the burette. If you fail to remove this air bubble, you will fill this with liquid and lose that volume and it will cause uh, imprecise results in your titration. To remove the air bubble, you simply, using the waste beaker, open the burette for a second or two and make sure that there's no air bubble present. Now that we've filled the burette up and removed the air bubble from the stopcock, we need to take the initial burette reading. To do that, you generally want to use something white. In this case, I have a white paper towel. You could use a piece of paper or anything else that's white because it provides contrast and allows you to be able to read the numbers more clearly. Here you can see that our volume measurement is between eight and nine milliliters. It's very important that we read it from the top down. So we're gonna read this as eight point something milliliters and not nine point something milliliters. So we read a burette from the top down. You'll also notice that we have tenths graduations on the burette. 
So since we have tenths graduations and we need one estimated digit, it means we have to e estimate the hundredths place. Said another way, our burette reading should have two decimal places. And all burette readings must have two decimal places, even if the last decimal place is a zero. In this case, we would read this as 8.72 milliliters. Now that I have the initial burette reading, I want to take my Erlenmeyer flask containing the acid and the indicator and place it under the burette for the first time. Notice that I never put this under the burette before because I didn't want to accidentally add any base into the uh, Erlenmeyer flask, which could cause some errors in the titration. Also notice that I have the stopcock placed on this side of the burette so I can use it with my right hand. I'm right-handed and I strongly recommend that you use your dominant hand to control the stopcock and then you use your other hand to swirl the flask. So I need to swirl the flask and control the stopcock at the same time. I want to begin by slowly adding some of the base from the burette into the Erlenmeyer flask while swirling. You'll notice that if I stop swirling for a second, you can actually see some pink color in the flask. This is a good way to know that you've added some indicator. I then want to continue the titration in such a way that I'm adding more and more base and you'll notice that the pink color begins to persist longer and longer as I reach the end point of the titration. My goal is to add a single drop of the base and have the solution turn and stay pink. In order to do that, when I get close to the end of the titration, I need to go very slowly. As I get closer and closer to the end of the titration, the pink color will persist longer and longer. At the end of the titration, I want to add just a single drop of the sodium hydroxide solution and have it turn the solution in the Erlenmeyer flask pink. This is how I know that I performed a proper titration. As you can see here, a single drop of the base causes the solution to turn and stay pink. This is the end point of the titration. Now that the solution is turned pink and we're complete, the titration is complete, we want to read the final volume of the titration. To do that, we again add our white paper and we read it to two decimal places. In this case, reading from the top down, we find that this is 18.79 milliliters. There's a couple other things that I would like to show you. The first one is that how important it is to make sure that the titration ends at a single drop. Here I'm going to show you what happens if I significantly over titrate the solution. So here I'm adding in 20 or 50 extra drops to show you what happens visually to the solution. You can see here I still have a pink solution. You can't easily visually distinguish this as an over titrated solution. Therefore, it's very important that when you're doing your titration, as you reach the end point, you make sure you finish the titration with just a single drop of sodium hydroxide solution. This takes practice and patience, and this lab is your opportunity to do those things. Now that you have completed the titration and have the initial and the final burette reading, it's time to clean up. We have designed this experiment so that the concentration and volume of the sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid solutions will exactly neutralize each other. So you should mix all your waste from your four titrations, we only did one here as an example, and all your leftover solutions into one container. You will then have approximately 0.2 molar sodium chloride or salt water. This solution can go down the sink. Although it may look a pink color, there's almost no phenolphthalein indicator as it is very dilute in these solutions. Also, as far as cleaning, you need to make sure that you thoroughly clean the burette. To do that, you want to use your waste beaker and drain any excess sodium hydroxide solution, which again would be combined in the waste. Once the solution has been drained, you want to use water and rinse the burette with several portions of water to ensure that there is no sodium hydroxide solution. Sodium hydroxide will clog burettes and ruin them. So please make sure that you thoroughly clean your burette so it's ready to go for the next person.